Editing and engineering by Jonathan Ian Manser. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows, and on Facebook and Twitter for updates. Or mods? And we're live in five, four, three. <clears throat> I don't have to tell you podcasts are bad, especially our podcasts. Everyone knows that. It's it's obvious. We're in a recession. You got kids unboxing toys, getting 50 million views, and we trying to do serious news, serious academic analysis here, and what, two views, cakes, or lies, everything's going crazy, and apparently I'm getting fired from this fucking podcast I've been working in for 25 years, so that's why, ladies and gentlemen, I regret to inform you that tonight right, will right, be my right, last... Right, we need to uh, shut this... We, we need to shut this... Leave down. him on! Leave him on! I am not going to allow get- Scott to embarrass himself further. <laughs> you gotta leave him on. We get 50, 60 viewers on this one. All right, but continue, but professional. <clears throat> well, hello there, and welcome back to The Lost Signals. Not quite reviews something, so if you haven't gathered, uh, we have just, uh, yesterday, me, Scott Thurlow, not Howard Beale, although I was channeling him, <laughs> here along with Jonathan Ian Manzer, uh, slash this, Max. This is a, a clusterfuck. <laughs> <laughs> it totally is, and Steve Ramosi. I have to... Uh, Get out of my character's head now. Yes. Come back to Steve Ramosi. The point is, we had just saw uh, the uh, network, or the pr- Broadway production of Network, starring Brian Cranston and various other quality actors, um, and it was a fucking awesome time, so we just figured we'd do an episode just sort of discussing it, again, not quite reviewing it, but be like, doing some correlations, like what they sort of kept from the original film, which we also did actually review the AFI film. You can check that episode out if you would like. Mm. We did it like last year, I believe. But yeah, so it was a cool time. It was in New York, like I said. And it was just a fucking really well done production. So, what do you guys? What were your initial impressions or thoughts about uh, the play version? Well, before uh, I do that, I just want to give a quick synopsis mm. over. In case way, you're unfamiliar, so this obviously is based off of the uh, film network. However, it's more focused on Howard Beale than network than the is. original movie. Was, yeah. it, it always surprises me. How Howard Beale, who's the memorable character from the film, actually is not really the main the, character. Yeah, yeah. Uh, secondary thing. This is mm. uh, Brian Cranston being given the opportunity right. to do like, almost a one-man show in a way of. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you're right. It's very focused on him, much more than the uh, film was. Yeah, sure. and the titular network and all of the shenanigans do play a role in the play, mm. but it's less so than it. The the focus of the film was so. Brian Cranston's a phenomenal actor, and he carried or he elevated this to a like the the great work that this is. Yeah, yeah, he did. Uh, th- there, there are very he plays the character very differently than the one in the movie. Um, almost more like he's lo- like you know it's obvious in the movie that Howard Beale's losing his mind, but. He seems more like doddering on on stage mm. in this one, yeah. Uh, or like you know, and, and at times at times it seems almost desperate to like grasp what he's um, trying to figure out, you know, how to say. Mm. And, and right before he goes into the big, I want you to get mad speech, um, you know, there's like a long silence that he does in, in the play. Yeah, it's and, it's it's done perform like you said. Not quite differently, but certainly um, a different angle yeah. than again the famous and Peter and, Finch, I think, was the actor who did originally in, in the movie. I re- yeah, I really, I really liked. You know, this performance mm. is really good. It made me look at the character in kind of a different way than than I remember him as like this, you know, kind of fire and brimstone yeah. prophet. He was more um, like he was. I don't want to say unhinged, but he wasn't not unhinged, if you will. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's it's this weird line, but he certainly brings a hell of uh, char- you know, charisma and talent, as you said, to the role. It also, again, because it's really begins and ends with his character, which is not technically the case of the film. Mm. It, you, it, the performance of uh, as you mentioned was more. I felt. I felt worse for Howard Beale in the play mm. than I did for yeah. in the film. Mm. And it felt more like he was being used by the people around him, whether it was the uh, average network, like a uh, middle manager trying to, 
either get rid of him or capitalize on his madness. More and than then him. you have the uh, the president who I, this was actually well done in the film as well. But like, I'm going to give you the narrative that I want you to push, yeah. and I don't care what the effects are of it because as long as my narrative comes out. But the fact that he's just being in his kind of breakdown, he's being pulled by all of these yeah, different trying to manipulate him for some reason or it, another. Yeah. Uh, and also, Max uh, plays less of a... I mean, he's not, like you said, the d- the big difference is Cranston as Beale is much more the focal point, like, by far. And Max's story is still there. They cover a lot of it, but he is not quite the focal point. But Max reversely. as a force for trying to save mm. uh, Howard Beale yeah. is less pronounced in the play. Yeah. I think they... Yeah, well, I think that's it. They take away parts of his characterization from the movie and give them, give them, not those exact things, but give that time to develop right. and Cranston a bit more, you know, Howard Beale a bit more. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, this, this was a, uh, it was really well done. It was a fantastic production. Um, very cool to see the use of cameras and, and um, this, the screens that they used was really interesting and something I really haven't seen from a play that I can think of. Uh, mm. you know, definitely not used in, in the way that they were used in, in this one. And I think it took a lot of like forethought and, and thinking about how they wanted to play with, um, with those kind of news tropes. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to get And what they have second. up on the screen in the background is mm. always kind of important. And I was, I was always kind of trying to keep an eye on that and, um, you know, not get, completely distracted by all the other things that were going on around to mm. not see what the vocal point was at the time because that happened a lot where I was like looking around the stage. I mean that happens in a lot of plays, but like I was looking around the stage to see what else was going on. Like in the news yeah. in the uh in the control booth. Control room, yeah. yeah, there's always stuff happening and like on screen there's always a lot of stuff that wasn't necessarily part of what was going on on stage. Things like that. Well, I mean if you think about it, like that's sort of kind of the point. Like because of the the nature and framework of this story, right? So it 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 lent itself a bit more to like they have one big TV screen sort of behind everybody and then a couple of smaller ones like around the stage mm. and sometimes it's showing you like uh, like unrelated stuff but it's still like it's like the TV is always there all consuming and even if you guys noticed the floor was mirrored so yeah. like that like would re- then reflect of course so like it's all like reflecting back at you so that was really really neatly designed and it ties into its themes and its message of course I believe there are also two uh, kind of mobile camera mm-hmm. men going around That's right. to highlight particular, like, either expressions of people who are in the corner who are, mm. as you're mentioning, are, like, having, I think even though the main, uh, attention should be on the, the stage. It's, I also want to say that it was, I, I found myself, it's actually like going to a uh, football game <laughs> where I'm like, I'm watching the big screen, even though it's happening. Literally, yeah, point of view. <laughs> but yeah, like, like I said, I'm watching Brian Cranston on the screen while he is, like, Right in front of me. But like I said, it's sort of more medically applicable in this case because of that. But it was a neat way to do it for sure. And you're right, like when you know the big famous um, get one you get mad speech, and even some other ones where they have like a person, like a production, like assistant, whatever, like literally like following his face with the camera, which mm-hmm. then projected onto the screens. Yeah. But you can still see him doing it you know, in front of yeah. you. So yeah, and also we had pretty good seats. I'll say like we were in the balcony, but like center balcony, so we were like mm-hmm. right there. And yeah, it was like you know, Rue. it's a small um, like they didn't. I guess I'll say the prop division did a good job, but it, they only had, like you said, Zivo, control booth, and then like the newsroom, and like a bar, which also like served as like um like Max's apartment as well, just like a couch yeah. or whatever, like a futon, right? So there's not a lot of stuff happening on in terms of that, right? So it's always like, and even like you said, what sometimes when a scene's happening, other characters are doing shit still yeah. there, like in the background almost, and sometimes a camera will then be on them, which is in the smaller ones. Mm-hmm. So you, it's almost forcing you to try to pay attention to all this stuff at once. A la watching TV. I, I, I actually want to bring up, uh, I, I want to bring up a quick point okay. first. Uh, as we're talking about style here, the scene where they actually have two of the actors go out onto the street. Now, before you go on, I thought that was pre-shot. Like they just it cut to it be. because it's TV. That's things, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe and, I, I would. So, like, I was thinking about that. I thought it wasn't pre-shot when I was watching it, but. That would make kind of sense because but think of what happens way. if somebody walks exactly, by and bucks up right? your shot? You know? Exactly, right? Like it could happen any random time. So I thought they had, they would set that up specifically and then cut to it, like showed it to you on screen. Because they so, have the magic trick towards the end. Yeah, which, yeah. Uh, 
I don't want to actually ruin because I think it's a really neat thing. It's really well pulled it. off, we'll say. Um, yeah. But the thing is, I don't know what, and to the point of the themes of this is that I don't know what's the reality of what they're showing me on the screen and mm. uh, what is like pre uh, kind of crafted. It's it's very well done, something I haven't seen. Yeah, it's prior. all smartly like transitioned and built into it. And I guess the thing I wanted to bring up is that while they stick pretty closely to the original story and even the script, there are certain little tweaks and changes which I thought were pretty like nice touches. Like it's not quite updated. Like nobody mentions cell phones per se. Nobody mentions mm-hmm. tablets. It's still like it's very obviously like it's established that it's still set in the seventies. Mm-hmm. But they still like do have some modern like winks and nods in a very smartly done way. I thought, mm-hmm. and not like an old meal overtly or eye rolling way to the audience. But like when he mentions the Russians, like he kind of like yeah. the way he uh, emphatically says that. Yeah. It was like it's a little bit. You know, it's, it's obviously a nod he almost, to the yeah, modern. Times. He almost like turns and winks at yeah. the audience when he yeah. does that. And like even like Cranston like the people who were sitting like down front center he went into the crowd huh. like when he gets his own show and like sat next to those people and like we're, he was talking to them like <laughs> integrating it into the show okay this is actually the point i want to bring up uh, first with it okay. uh, i like the audience interaction aspect of this mm-hmm. when you, you when they converts uh towards the end when the howard beale show is taken off and they've commercialized it uh they commercialize this populism you the you have they ask the audience to uh, chant out uh, yeah. not as hell uh, uh, yeah uh, I have a question. There, when his breakdown scene, uh, the very famous one from the movie and one that was really well done. In the Certainly one of the highlights. Yeah. Brian Cranston. When he goes, go to your windows and shout out, uh, I'm mad as hell and I can't take it anymore. I wonder how many people get up and engage with that. Because I wanted to, but nobody else was. And mm-hmm. there wasn't kind of like the, the when you get to the, uh, the thing I was just talking about with the Howard Beale show. It signals to you. We want you yeah, to participate. Yeah, they outright say it to you. But sure. I wonder how many how many times someone does get up <laughs> like and does participate or whatever. there. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting. So I'll just real quick. So I, we were, when we were on our way to into the city, mm-hmm. I said to you guys, like, do you think they'll have some crowd participation, like, that, a la that specifically? And you're right. Like, I felt to me, I was like, should I do it? I'm like, no, not, no, not feel as if I'm be, you know, rudely interrupting the play. And then later on, they outright say, okay, now it's time for all you to, you know, right. everyone's waiting for it, so. Yeah, there wasn't, there's not really that moment that they give you to, they don't give you, when when he's actually doing the speech, he doesn't give you a moment to right. actually get up there's and no do it. There's no pause for the audience to do that yeah. at that point. So yeah. It's definitely like a directing the audience what to do type of thing without mm. flat out telling them what to do, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I could see somebody who doesn't take social cues all that well, like getting up and saying something. <laughs> <laughs> he said he almost considered. I, I was almost there. Yeah. Because like the thing is, like you, if you're familiar with the original work, then like you're re- you're like you want to be like raring to go for that. Right. But because it's a different, you know, it's a play and not a movie, then it's a little, you know they have to sort of shift it around a bit. Yeah. I did like his. Uh... Like improving with the two women he sat with. <laughs> yeah. just, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming he does something like that every single performance, yeah. which is fucking amazing, for right? Sure. Like it, one of them's named Shirley, and he immediately goes to the old like Shirley, you jest joke. <laughs> yeah, but like pulled it out like right away. You know, he's just like yeah, he was really seamless. comfortable. Yeah, uh, wandering around in the audience as Howard Beale, which is really cool. Well, he has great comedic timing, and he yeah, he's a very he that. knows he has a very commanding sense of presence. Like for example. Just even before that, he went he, as he was walking down. Somebody had their coat in the aisle. Remember? Yeah. So he moves it. and He's like, you know, they have a coat check right here, right? <laughs> like he just like dropped it in yeah. there and like, just, just went on. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, like yeah, I mean, his improv skills and his acting skills, of course, are amazing. And I mean, not to say that everyone else wasn't wasn't pretty fantastic. I, I don't remember. I don't have it in front of me. I should, but I believe the woman who played Diane was Tatiana something. She was in Parks and Rec. We discovered. Yeah. Later on, uh, yes, she was. If you, it doesn't matter if you can't think right, of who she was. She was one but, of Tom's, like, uh, Tom Haverford's, sure, like, but, <laughs> love interest. I thought she did a pretty good job as Diane, and um, Max, the guy who played Max, also was pretty solid, damn solid. And so, maybe I'll just go through it real quick. You guys tell me. There was also uh, Frank Hackett, which was Robert Duvall's character, and the guy who played him I thought was pretty spot on. Like, I liked his, like, his sort of, like, not fire and brimstone, but he he was, like, the madman kind of exec. They have a scene that was tremendously structured mm. where I forget why I, we're clapping, but I think like just a great acting bit and they know that the audience is going to clap after. I think it's part one of Brian Cranston's thing. And he immediately comes out and acts as if the applause is was it, for I him. I noticed that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is crafted <laughs> really well. Yeah. Yeah. The directing of it was fantastic. Like I said, like I mentioned, 
And also, so I'll mention this, it's not quite part of the play, but I don't know how, we tried to guess how much these tickets would have cost. There's, the, the left side of the stage is the control booth, the middle is the newsroom, and or just like a random room, and then the right side is where the futon was, like I was mentioning, and then people were sitting having dinner. Like mm, next to that, yeah. as th- th- as part of the audience, and Cranston like walk through them too. I wonder what those like those tickets must have been yeah. fifteen hundred dollars. That's each, what we were know? saying. Like we have no idea, but it must be like up there, but st- still a pretty big thrill to have them like eating, to have to be able to eat dinner and have some drinks, and as you're like literally feet away from Cranston as he's mm. performing. So I have uh, I pulled up the cast here. Okay. So uh, we'll go over who we already said. Um, Diana is. Um, Tatiana Maslany. Yes. Uh, Credit to her. Yep. Ma- who else did you mention? Frank Hackett. Yep. Joshua Boone. Yep. Okay. Uh, Max Schum- uh, Schumacher is uh, Tony. Tony Goldwyn. something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Harry is Julian Elijah Martinez. He was. He actually did really a really good job too. I liked him. Yep. And the last one I want to mention is who played um Mr. Jensen. Mr. Jensen. Or Ad- I can't remember his first name. It's something Jensen. Uh, the guy who owned like the entire. Conglomerate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. While you're looking that up, I just want to make a Played by Ned him. Beatty in the film. He is... He has a commanding presence because... Yes. He ha- they put him on a balcony over Brian Cresson's Howard Beale. But the way he was speaking to him, it's it's the performance that I felt... A performance mm. that actually challenged Brian Cresson's dominating performance. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. because that's how it's supposed to be. But it's... Again, it could have come off as... Right. It, w- if they mishandled it, it wouldn't yeah. have been as effective. I totally agree so with that. So the actor did a phenomenal job there. Yep. Uh, and it's Arthur Jensen's Arthur name Jensen. is uh, Nick Wyman. Yeah. He's the guy that played him. So yeah, exactly like that. So yeah. at the, again, what, that's one of my personal favorite scenes from the original movie when he goes to the boardroom. He's like, you have meddled in the primal forces, Mr. Beale, mm-hmm. et cetera. Right? He's, like, like, he's like, there are no nations anymore. There's just companies, et cetera. So he's like, now I want, I want you to um, basically push that narrative on your show. But yeah, like, as you said, he literally is like, probably 10, 15 feet above Cranston when he delivers that speech to him in the play. And yeah, it's effective because he's, he's literally looking down at him being like, all right, yeah, you think you're hot shit. Here's, here's how, here's how it really works. And here's what you're going to do from now on. So what I tell you to do, I, um, not that I didn't, I, I really love that. Yeah, scene. And I, I was going to say, going but into, I had a had little to, bit of an issue yeah. with them putting him up above, um, you know, Beale's character because in the, Origin in the movie, you know, they're at a, a huge, like, uh, long meeting table, conference table, yeah. and they uh, it's obviously what the power dynamic is, but he's on the same level. The reason that he has that elevated position over uh, Beale in that scene is the power of his performance, and it's not like a, a visual. I mean, I guess it is a visual thing, I mean, right? He's all the way down the long conference table and starts yeah. to, like, circle around. I don't know. I just, for whatever reason, I, I wasn't... Didn't think it was that as good? I, I liked... I, no, I, I, I thought it was really good. I just prefer the movie hmm. version better. That's fair. The, the reason I like this one, and I'm not saying it's better, or, but I just... the th- uh, One of the things they're going for here is the kind of belief systems and ideologies and... They they really bring up the profit angle of Howard Beale yeah. mm. as a kind of a populist, manic populist who speaks to channels people. like the rage and the frustration yeah. of the common man. And in a way, it's it's that religious symbolism of the white room and the uh, mm, uh, Mr. Jensen I didn't above think about that. him, yeah. and like uh, he's talking to God. At this right, point. he literally he did say he's when like, he says I, think I, I just seen God. God. Yeah. yeah, that's true. But no, but it's <laughs> he uses point, some yeah. of the language uh, that mm. uh, Power Beale said earlier was what he, the for, uh, what's really called him to uh, become who he the prophet he right, was. Right, right. No, I like that. Uh, Shit, I didn't so think about that. But I think uh, that's visually what they're trying to get there. Yeah. And on that front, I think it does work very well, of mm-hmm. course. Like, you're right about that. I just didn't think of it myself, but I do like it as a, as an angle there. Very nice. But Dig that, it. That, that's, again, that's one of the themes they're going for. Uh, that, speaking of themes, though, I brought this up that it, it, you were mentioning earlier there's certain nods to the modern day, but they're keeping the 70s uh, sort of bad, plot yeah. line good. And I wonder if it could have been updated to a modern newsroom and modern issues and i think because a couple of stuff felt just like watching network some stuff rings true because it's uh Still, yeah, time universal time. Yeah. uh topics but some of the stuff is patty hearst yeah, brought they, up, they uh, definitely addressed that in both the play and the 
movie like directly as a, a um common occurrence or not a uh, current affair. Oh, the only thing that actually that to rebut myself there, the one time they did do the update was showing all the presidents. Yeah. Uh, well, I was going to wait to get to that because yeah. that was the very ending. Yeah. But yeah, that was something that certainly I think was completely new, like introduced mm-hmm. to, to the stage production. But no, like like I said, it's it's a great production, a very enjoyable show, and of course, Cranston kills it, but, and everyone else does a great job as well. Mm-hmm. And I, I do have to give a lot of credit to the adaptation, like to, again, the producer, the director, and whoever uh, has adapted the script, mm-hmm. because it's everything you know. If you're familiar, again, with the movie, it's everything you know and love. And if you're not, I think it does a great job of presenting all the material to you in a way that you can understand and you understand what's happening. Some of it, as you, one of you mentioned, is was a little condensed, like Max's story, Max and Diane's like, romance, and the scene where he leaves his wife or his wife kicks him out. It, that, that's all there. We had Max as the protagonist of Network yeah, in the movie. Right, and clearly, as it, it, yeah. one of the bigger changes is that they sort of reverse that in the stage yeah. direction. Yeah. Like, it sort of makes sense, of course, because Kranz is like, the biggest name, and mm-hmm. he's the draw, so they want to put the spotlight mm-hmm. more on him. And totally makes sense, totally works. I'm just saying, like... I did enjoy some of the little tweaks, and it's it's it ran for its running time is about almost as long as a movie, like two hours and change, even with no intermission, which I was fine with. I'm just saying, even within that though, they did condense a bit of the plot threads mm-hmm. from the original. But I thought that was a smart idea in order for them to allow more time for to focus on Kranz and Slash Beal. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, I I don't know. I I was gonna mention. Sorry, I was going to mention um, kind of that dynamic of Max and between Max and, and Howard Beale mm. and how they, I mean, they still have like the same friendship still friends as, from, from as in the film, right? But you're right, it is, it is like a complete 180 of who is the main character in this and who is the, you know, interesting side it, character. It literally right? says there a Howard Beale story. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah, you're right, though. That's that's right, like right in the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah they put that up. But again, he's the most interesting character from, and oddly enough, it works to like sometimes when you elevate a secondary character who is meant to be like it doesn't work quite well because you don't have that grounding. But I think they did a good job of build, establishing Howard Beale as a character. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, he's sure. got he's got a lot of uh, he's got a beefy part in the movie as well so like there's a lot to work with there it's not like he was a throwaway yeah i mean the original like i said the original stuff is so strong that like it's one i don't want to say easier but it might lend itself to doing the very thing we just said if you're gonna like switch it up because it's that strong it's already can baked in essentially to the story Mm -hmm. itself that yeah even though they sort of did the 180 where Max is almost the secondary character and Bill is now the main character Mm -hmm. but it still is pretty fucking seamless because of both of them are still great roles, and you can see you, you, they can t- they sort of run parallel to each other. If I may, uh, because I don't think he was in there as much as you remember him being. Because I think it's no, uh, he, to, to, I mean, to he the, said that. Yeah. To the, but to the example of uh, that kind of character is uh, Hannibal Lecter hmm. and Sons of the Lambs yeah. wasn't in there very often. It's who you remember from the film, right? Uh, and then, oh, we're going to elevate him to be the star of things. So again. Sometimes I mean, they did make a like movie called Hannibal. Yeah. But yeah. sometimes characters work better as kind of the, not the main focus point, but just a strong yeah, second. The walk-on parts in the war, but, if you will. Okay. This was done well. Yep. I yeah. absolutely agree. So I wanted to ask you guys what else we, we wanted to talk about, because we briefly touched on themes, I guess. But um, we've, I think we've mostly been talking about the characters and, uh, you know, going on and on about how good Brian Cranston was, um, which is all true. But, so, the original, do, do you think that the themes are any different than the original uh, in this? Or, like, it, wh- how are they, I was gonna say, like, uh, changed at the core, from, from the movie to the to the play? Right, at the core, I don't think they're any different. Like, I don't see how you could <laughs> change them all that much. I just think they're going for, again somewhat of a bit of a modern spin like it's odd like it's really hard to describe this without having seen anyone listening without having seen the play but certainly the core themes are there but like i said they tweak a few things and like even add a bit on it like for example i don't believe they said the medium is the message in the film but they did say that in the play Mm -hmm. and and like one i believe also they give more doesn't an extra scene or two or at least extended when beale gets his own show when he is the howard beale show and he's like you know coming out on stage 
that he talks more about that very thing. He's like, TV is not real, but he only realizes as if it is, and you think your lives aren't real. I don't think he made that speech, or at least to that degree, in the movie. So I think on that angle, there's, they, they touch on that a bit more mm. versus the original work. But I still think it, at the end of the day, they're going for the same general message. So I think that's one of the big differences to me, like how it differed, or at least how they addressed it. Well, all right. Go ahead. Although it was present in this, I believe the forefront of uh, Network the Film was really looking into the network and the politics of it. Mm. Uh, and yeah. Howard Beale is the interesting character in his message, but I think that's secondary focus. And they, it, with the 180 from Max to Howard Beale, they swap the messages. So the that's network, different. the network kind of shenanigans and the infighting and it's all sort that. It's sort of now more secondary. Yeah, definitely kind secondary of. and often framed through, uh, Howard Beale's show, mm. particularly. Mm. Uh, so they dropped the, mostly the entire plot line of the rebel groups. It's like, yeah, it, it's briefly a scene yeah. or two, but they don't, yeah, right, they don't go into it as much mm -hmm. uh, versus the original film, which I thought, again, was fine. It's a fine c condensing yeah. of it, but yeah, I'm, go I'm on. Not, I'm just saying that yeah. thematically they went away right. from that. Uh, and it went, that thus it took on the idea of, so you have Howard Beale as a character who speaks to people and in a sense, like, what people identify with on the TV and the more he kind of breaks against the format mm. the more popular he is and when they try to when he's convinced that tv is good and that humans aren't individuality was not worth much and corporate uh we're all cogs and that's fine yeah, uh, yeah. he loses viewers there and it leads to spoiler the end the, <laughs> the, uh do the sh corporate chains which leads to his death yeah uh but i mean so it's not much different but it's again the inverted nature of it yeah so i, can, I think it is a big difference to answer your original question sivo and to go back to something else you asked i was gonna throw it to you guys that so the biggest change is after the play itself the action of the play is over on the on the big tv screen they well, then Hold on, before we okay. go to that, I want to address um, okay. kind of the Sorry. themes. <laughs> Good. Um, Answer your own question. <laughs> yeah, so I was trying to remember if I had this idea when I was watching the movie of, like, this speaks to me in terms of how, <laughs> like, the way that Max treats Diana or looks at Diana in this and the way that she looks at him. Mm -hmm. Seems to parallel like the ways that you know baby boomers and uh, Generation X look at millennials now, right? Um, you know, with in that relationship, it's like, oh, she's the TV generation. She like <laughs> yeah. it doesn't have feelings, you know, like that type of thing. And like I see that type of thing all the time, and I'm trying to remember if I felt that way when I was watching the movie, or if that's like a uh, sub uh, theme that kind of. That came out from was play. accentuated mm -hmm. in the play over like some other ones. When, when you condense something like that, you bring about because you don't have time to slowly develop it. So it's kind of more in focus of or, or and kind of more uh, forcefully stated. Right. But uh, quickly, what I remember, it's uh, they also did taking the plot lines of the movie. They paralleled them more. <coughs> so you have Max getting fired after twenty five years, mm. and then him cheating on his wife after 25 years and those parallels again which were probably in the film but because of condensed nature uh is more focused than you saw the irony of situation yeah 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 no i think that's a really good point actually yeah for, for speaking of, like some of the differences and because of the changes in the way they um unfolded the narrative then yeah i think that it's it's a bit more noticeable sivo to answer your question like i think i did get it uh, derive that right. more easily than upon watching the original film yeah. Um, so yeah, then I guess go on to what we were going to... Okay, unless, well, you got anything else? You got something else? Just had, uh, sorry, go. Yeah, so the big thing is like, so this is one of the things we discussed right when we walked out, when the play was over, that once the action of the play, like, Cranston makes a final speech as Beale, and then, like, sort of, on the, on the big screen, the TV screen that was serving as the backdrop for the whole play, they're just showing uh, presidential inaugurations, mm -hmm. starting with, I think, Jimmy Carter... Believe in it. From, I, think, I think it started with Gerald Ford. Actually. Ford, yeah, yeah, okay. Ford up till Trump. Right. So, like, you know, like, I guess that's like one little, like, final audience thing. Obviously, many people being New York booed Trump and cheered Obama. Not all of us, I suppose, but. but War criminals, yes. a lot of them. Yes, they're all corrupt. I got you. But I'm saying, like, that's like something completely new, like, that was introduced for this film. So, what do you guys think about that? Like, 
I, I didn't like it. And it felt uh, pandering. It I felt, knew, yeah, exactly. I knew what it was going to be. Yeah. It felt mm-hmm. pandering. It was. Mani- it like felt manipulative, right? Thing. Like this entire point of this, the movie and now the play is about how dangerous it is to like whip people up into a, or not the entire point, but like one of the points one of the major things is yeah. how dangerous it is to like, or and how dangerous people can be as like mobs, like that mob mentality. And I, I think that, well. I mean, not maybe they were making a point with this, and maybe that was the point. Well, of I don't think, I think there's ever a mob mentality, and I think that the uh, and I meant this. I just remember what I want to say mm, is that journalists aren't inherently good people. There are good journalists, there are terrible journalists out there. There's this weird thing in America where uh, press is sacrosanct, but it's not, uh, and they make this point in the play. Yeah, where, that's true. You think you're, you're here's what you're running for the day to get uh, get audiences. Yeah, you think you're right. morally, um, ethically above everybody. Yeah. You're not. Yeah. And but the thing is, it's infotainment now. It's mm. uh, you. If you're a liberal, you can find liberal pundits who will tell you exactly what you want to hear. If you're a conservative, you can find conservative pundits who tell you exactly what you want to hear. You'll hate the other side because you're told to hate the other side. Mm. And it, whether and it's likely a corporate person behind it who has an ideology who's saying that oh, I agree with the left, so I'm going to promote my, the left agenda right. here. I program will be left is leaning or, and, and vice uh, versa. Or, uh, the very famous one is the guy from Fox News, uh, Rupert Murdoch, hmm. who around the world he promotes his ideology, uh, whether it makes him money the way he does it, but you know, the ideology is more important. So um, yeah, he's I think that, and I think at the end it's showing that is kind of a litmus test to <clears throat> how people are so obsessed with their side winning and what their cheerleaders are telling them to uh it's it's almost like um I think like cheer now uh, right. audience clap it, now it's almost yeah. that audience clap now like uh, <laughs> you see obama when you're in new york clap now you see trump in new york uh, boo uh and maybe perhaps that's what it's doing but i just thought it was pandering at the end and yeah. i just got whooped up so, so it's apologize. funny cause that's, that's what I, but that's what i meant by mob mentality yeah no know? i know like that's it's funny because you guys are like seemed more like a Pavlovian it's not, response. It's not at this offended point. about it. Like, yeah, I got like it was obviously that, but it wasn't. Here, here's, I guess, my question: If they took that out of the play, it'd be fine, right? In fact, you might say it's even it would be better. They didn't have that at the end, a little sort of stinger of all the presidents. I mean, like, I don't think it added anything. Right? You, you're saying what was the point of it? Right. Like, and I get like I get that too. But again, it wasn't that bad to me. But also, I agree that it didn't add all that much. But, like, but maybe here's my here's my question: Why did they put that on on the end of the play? I didn't I don't I didn't understand what the point of even doing it was. Yeah. yeah. Because I guess the guy who grabbed it was just like me and wanted to see how many people uh, would uh, <coughs> well, would clap if he would applause. Like I said, I I can't speak for the actual like decisions making who the producers and so forth who did that. But if you think of it like my one thing i said to you steve on when we were uh, on the train back was that it's almost like could be a meta commentary like a la what you sort of just said right. right so maybe it's sort of a satire parody i guess we don't know for sure but i could see it being that like that's how i can kind of take that's it as what, that's what i'm saying I'm, I'm not saying that it's not that or like anything like that i'm saying why why even who, have it what yet? does this have to do with network <laughs> sure. the play right <laughs> like no, that's that's kind question. of like my what right. I was questioning as it was happening, like as soon as I was saying to you guys, gotcha. like by the time Reagan was on giving his thing, oh, I was like, okay. "Oh, I know exactly what's happening. Okay. I know what's going to happen. I know what the end of this is." <laughs> and like, yeah, I, I was like, "Why are they doing?" It? Like, I didn't, I didn't like, if they understand to, why they did it. They could have showed, uh, they could have famous some other shit. Yeah, no. like yeah, you could have had Rachel Maddow. Yeah, and, something uh, having to do with Sean the news, Hannity, you know? and mm-hmm. you would have had the exact same reaction. Right. It would have been the same and, difference. Uh, sure, I get what you're saying, and that would have made more sense yes. at least to me, you know. No, no, I get you. Like, yeah, so maybe it was like the quote unquote weakest part of it because it was again like sort of the fucking code of like the stinger to the play. <laughs> yeah, it's but no, like, <laughs> it's tongue in a bad way. But no, everything else, uh, like like we said, we've just been pretty much gushing over. It was absolutely fantastic. Highly recommend it if you have the means to go see this production. Mm. It should be running for a while. No, nope, until June. Uh, so as of this, it's it's early March. A few so months left. Got a couple months left. They're going to be very expensive tickets. Go get them now. Mm-hmm. But if you can, for <laughs> real, like it's, it was it was a great time. So I'll just have to say cheers to E for getting the tickets for us. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Sir. It was fantastic. And it was a great time. Everybody in the play and the production, as we just said, hell of a job. Good on you. Keep it up. I don't know. I don't have anything to say. Surprisingly, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm still bringing you the news, but I have no news to say. But no, like I said, like we weren't like quite going to do a review because we've never really done stage plays as reviews. But it was mm-hmm. something that tied into what we cover here on the channel. So I give it a nine. I'd probably give it a, a nine point five. It's, it's got a nine share or whatever, whatever a good share. Yeah, is. it's a, it's up there. It's up there in that range. I kind of like Blackbird a little bit better. 
Um, Nancy, I didn't see that with you guys. Maybe. I'd have to. I'd have to think about. It. I hadn't. I hadn't. It was, that was it two great actors mm. and just them. them. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's so, true. I mean, that's sort of a different beast. To be to be fair. But no, either way, like th- this production of Network on Broadway was fantastic, mm-hmm. and Cranston still kills it. And I still think like the story is so still relevant, even if it's like only adding on a couple of things here and there to update itself. It didn't need to be because you said some so much of it is just still timeless, still relevant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I do want to say this. I think this was a good uh, idea for a podcast, and I think that if we do things in the future, we should. Uh, do more, these, cover like, more special of sure. events. If you go to more cultural events like <laughs> these, we'll uh, we'll certainly tell you about them. At least our thoughts on on them as well. Yeah. Uh, and on that, um, uh, go see Metric. They were great. We'll do concert reviews soon enough as well. But no, I think unless you guys have anything else to say about Network, the Broadway production featuring Brian Cranston, yeah. Other than that, was fucking great and still stands. Still, a really, really good adaptation, and the script is so strong, and everyone put on a fucking great performance. Yeah. Well. I'll be signing off and bringing you the news ne- next week or whatever we're doing next week. I've been Scott Thurlow here with my production manager slash best friend, John Elian Manzer. I need you to get angry and go write comments in our YouTube page. <laughs> I want you to get mad at us. And uh, along with my uh, up-and-coming programmer, director, Stephen Amosi. Mm. What if we killed Howard Beale? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good idea. <laughs> All right. Level 50 share. Have a good night. Well, we'll see you next time. Good night. Bye. Editing and engineering by Jonathan Ian Manser. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows, and on Facebook and Twitter for updates. Or mods? <laughs>